Hi, uh, welcome to the second day of the third forum of the Asian Industrial Heritage Conservation hosted by Ani. My name is Malshri Joshi and I'm joining you uh, from New Delhi. I'm the host for the session today that is titled Sustainability and Challenges of Industrial Heritage. I uh, am the coordinator for the National Scientific Committee on Industrial Heritage at ICOMOS India and also represent TIKI in India. Uh, I am happy to welcome our speakers for the day, Dr. Miles Oglethorpe, Professor Mike Robinson and Paul Mahoney, who are joining us from Scotland, UK and New Zealand. We're also joined by Professor Dr. Zhao Wei Lin, who's the co-chair of ANI, joining us from Taiwan. Today, we are hoping to discuss the current pandemic and what it means to the field of industrial heritage and learn about strategies for sustainable development. We have a diverse panel today, and I'm hoping that we will be able to learn from each other and share experiences. Uh, please join me in uh, raising questions to our experts via YouTube. Uh, welcome to the session once again, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Please welcome the keynote speaker, Dr. Miles Oglethorpe, Chair of the International Committee for the Conservation of Industrial Heritage, better known as TIKI. Dr. Miles is the Head of Industrial Heritage at the Historic Environment Scotland. The title of his speech today is, Now is the time for our industrial heritage to prove its value. Hello, greetings to the Asian Network of Industrial Heritage. My name is Miles Oglethorpe and I'm President of TIKI at the moment. I wanted to start by saying thank you for your invitation to speak at the forum today. Um, I am in fact very sad that I can't be with you in person today because I've been to a couple of forums before and they have been truly outstanding occasions and I've loved every moment of them and I was looking forward to this one before obviously the pandemic intervened. So I'm very sorry not to be with you but at the same time I'm very delighted to be able to join you in this virtual form. And it is true that the pandemic has brought about true tragedy on a global scale and no country and very few people have been left untouched by it. But it has undoubtedly brought unexpected benefits. And one of those is the virtual and digital revolution that we've all been turbocharged into, some of us less voluntarily than others, I confess to being very nervous of the technology. But in truth, it has been empowering. So today I, I, I'm in effect going to be trying to talk to you about turning adversity into advantage, which this technology helps us do. Um, and I think in the process of doing this, um, we need to be sure that we ensure industrial heritage is recognized for the asset that it is. Um, and that in the context of the pandemic recovery, it has a great deal to offer. So a few things I'd like us to think about, and like you to think about uh, while this presentation proceeds. We need to, as I said, to remind ourselves of the value of industrial heritage. Uh, we think we must emphasize its strategic value in a wider context beyond heritage. And we need to identify the values that make it an asset and not a liability. We have to bear in mind that many people do not see it this way. Many people see industrial heritage as an obstacle and we need to change their minds. We need to remember um, that it is in effect a major link to the people's history, to real history. And that means it has value to communities. And if you look at the recently updated UNESCO World Heritage Guidance, the word community has been in, introduced in so many parts of it. And they see uh, working with heritage as being a bottom-up process that begins with the communities and getting communities on board. Now, industrial heritage is so well placed to do that. It's particularly powerful in the context of placemaking and sustainable development. And it's a vital resource in achieving recovery and regeneration where there have been issues of decline and loss of community morale. It's an intergenerational asset and an educational asset, so it allows us to speak between our generations. And I don't think any other branch of heritage 
offers this sort of potential. So the Asian network of industrial heritage and its global partners, uh, European Roots of Industrial Heritage, other organizations like Incuna and Tiki, of course, are uniquely placed to push industrial heritage to the front of the agenda when it comes to emerging from the pandemic. And before we go any further, I'd like just to remind us all of a moment in 2012, which was the opening of the 2012 Olympics in London. And um, this was something I wasn't looking forward to. I was expecting it to be a dire affair. And as it turned out, Danny Boyle, the director, produced something perhaps the first time I have seen industrial heritage, our industrial past and history, promoted on the world stage so effectively. And the, the, this was received very positively indeed. And what it shows, to me at least, is that our industrial heritage is widely appreciated by normal people and working communities across the world. And therefore, we should have confidence in promoting it in the future. And one way of promoting our industrial heritage in all of your countries is to take a look at what your national priorities are, what your government and local governments are wanting to do uh, by way of promoting um, development and well-being in each of your countries. And in Scotland, we have something called the National Performance Framework. So a couple of years back, we set about drafting an industrial heritage strategy that aligned itself with our government's priorities, because we knew that there'd be no way of eliciting much in the way of political and economic financial support, especially from the public sector, if we weren't aligning ourselves to the wider objectives of government. And this isn't difficult when you look at what a lot of countries' objectives are, particularly in relation to, example, to sustainable development and education. Industrial heritage has enormous potential to fulfil and to support these aims. And one of the things that's a really good uh, approach is to search out exemplars of good practice and success. And over the last year or so, I have been immensely privileged to be able to visit Asturias in northern Spain and to see some of the work that they've been doing, which is indeed exemplary. And if you take, for example, Incuna, which is a, a, a national network based in Asturias, but with a global reach, particularly into Latin America and across other parts of Europe, you can see how that has inspired the work of the people in Asturias and in northern Spain more generally. And if you look at the Asturias coal industry, for example, that is on its last legs. I think it may, the last mine may have finally closed now. Uh, but what they've been doing is being proactive and getting in there before important, most important sites have been destroyed, making sure that they can be protected and also protecting other assets um, and associated with the coal industry and working with the coal communities. And this has resulted in international links, for example, with my own country, Scotland and our National Mining Museum, and the saving of some very spectacular mining heritage sites. So there's so much remains of the coal and mining landscape in Asturias compared to in Scotland, Wales or England, for example. So they've done a grand job. And that has extended to obviously uh, preserving some of the uh, artifacts associated with the industry, but also extensive records, both of the operations themselves and of the mining communities themselves, and a lot of the culture that goes with the mining in the region. So they've done a superb job and hugely impressive. One of the other things about Incuna, for, especially for the Asian network to consider, is the um, scale of output of papers, many of which are published regularly, not just in association with their uh, annual conferences, but with uh, in, in thematic studies and, and so on. So they, it, it really does 
uh, attract a lot of attention. And in this case, or last year, we had contributions from the Museum of Hydropower in Norway, which is one of the great uh, energy museums in the world. So, so really, it, take a look at Incuna and to see what, what they've been doing. Uh, and this enthusiasm has overflowed into neighboring regions of Spain, such as Galicia, and we were able to visit this amazing uh, limonite iron ore calcining site um, in Galicia. Um, so uh, really inspiring stuff. But I think at this point it's worth stressing the work of the Astorias people probably has its roots in the enormous success of Catalonia. Some of you will know Eusebi Casanellas and he was responsible for this phenomenal museum in Terrassa and this was where Tiki was based and he was president of Tiki, uh, two presidents before me, and he built up this incredible network of museums and resources for the Catalonia area or region, um, which also is well tied into their education system. Um, so a, an absolutely magical example of what can be done with your industrial heritage. So if you're looking for inspiration and support in trying to do something for your industrial heritage, then a really good place to start is on the Tiki website and to look at some of our documents that define what industrial heritage is and what's important about it. We kicked this off most recently in 2003 with the Nizhny Tagil Charter, which was signed in the Siberian region of Sverdlovsk in Russia. And then it was enshrined in partnership with ICOMOS, with whom we work very closely on industrial heritage, in what we call the Dublin Principles in, in 2011. And um, these really do give you a, a useful handle on how to present industrial heritage, how to describe it, how to, to uh, demonstrate that it's an asset and uh, what it can actually do for you in your various countries. So use these resources and, and do indeed engage with Tiki, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Another center of industrial excellence is Poland. And like many countries and like ourselves in Scotland, they've had many casualties because there's so much to lose. But they've also done some incredible things, such as in the textile city of Łódź and here in Upper Silesia, uh, where they again, like in Astorias, their coal mining industry is gradually coming to a close with an amazing range of architecture from different periods, from the German period of Silesia through to the Soviet period. You can see a, a great uh, Soviet period uh, tower on the top right hand side and mining villages with incredible architecture. So they're doing some great things trying to save this, this uh, extraordinary industrial heritage. Here's another example of one of the great coal mines. And increasingly, um, they are getting more industrial heritage onto UNESCO's World Heritage List, such as the Tarnowski Gori Lead and Silver Zinc Mine up on the top right. They have a superb um, zinc uh, factory museum uh, on the bottom right here. And it's worth remembering that it was the Poles that got industrial heritage onto the World Heritage List in the first place with the inscription of the Wieliszka Salt Mine. Um, ne near Krakow in the early days of World Heritage. So, so the Poles are, are really, really impressive. And um, back in Scotland, we have managed to demonstrate what what is possible by saving some of the more iconic uh, pieces of industrial urban landscape. This, these are examples are in the Clyde, in Renfrewshire. So this, these are sugar warehouses and refineries in, in uh, Greenock, uh, and they have formed the heart of a riverside in the, in the Clyde regeneration scheme. And what it showed was there was not the need to lose amazing pieces of industrial architecture, like Fergusley number one spinning mills, which you can see at the bottom right, which despite being given the top level of protection, were lost in the 1980s. This was part of the global Coates and Clark empire of cotton thread. So you don't need to lose this stuff, you can reuse it and the character of your city or town can live on. This has been no better demonstrated than in Dundee, which was the center, world center of the jute industry, jute textile industry, until it died. And thanks to the protection regimes imposed by the Scottish Government Agency Historic Scotland, my organization, 
Uh, it, it was possible to stop many of these mills from being demolished. The character of Dundee has survived, and it's because of this strong heritage character that the Victorian Albert Museum in London decided to build its first major annex outside London in Dundee, and that has proved to be an amazing success. You can see the, the building on, on the right side of this slide, a truly amazing place. But the industrial heritage allowed it to be sufficiently attractive to attract this museum. And um, even the most mundane industrial heritage can be iconic. Uh, I regard cranes as being uplifting heritage, not just in terms of uplifting stuff, but uplifting morale. And these cranes are part of the Imperial Shipyard in Gdansk, which was where Solidarity, the Solidarity Movement led by Lech Walesa, uh, was was born. And people are trying to save this shipyard at the moment. And even though Gdansk is a Hanseatic port of great beauty, hundreds of years old, when you go there at Christmas, what of their Christmas decorations, their Christmas illuminations are of cranes. And that tells you how much the industrial heritage is built into the psyche of the local population. Obviously, there are some really iconic pieces of industrial heritage out there. For us, the fourth bridge is the great catalyst for promoting our industrial heritage in Scotland. Uh, and there are other examples like Volkling and Ironworks in Saarland in, in Germany, a, a truly astonishing place. But I think it's really important to remember that this is at the top end, the massive scale. And industrial heritage exists at all scales. And at the smaller scale, the texture is really, really important and it can play a major part and a much more sustainable part and a much more adaptive part in any rege regeneration and recovery strategy. So it doesn't need to be enormous and iconic to be able to make a difference. And this is well illustrated by this power station that you can find in the center of, of Istanbul. Uh, and it's now, thanks to a major conversion scheme, part of the University of Bilgi. And it's really interesting because it's a fully functioning university campus, but they've managed to save an awful lot of the original equipment inside it, generation equipment, uh, control rooms and so on. So it makes for an absolutely fascinating environment for study and also uh, especially for technical students and architects and so on. It really gives them an inspiring environment in which to learn their trade. So it's a very special place. And in a city like Istanbul, whose traditional heritage and architecture is unsurpassed in the world, to find this piece of fantastic industrial heritage was really inspiring. And when sticking with energy, some energy is, is, is equally inspiring for different reasons. And in this period of climate awareness and climate emergency, it's really good to know that the heritage of renewables is really significant too. And for Scotland, we have a really interesting and inspiring history of renewable heritage, particularly hydropower. So this is, you mustn't just rule out uh, something because you don't think it would be of interest because even the modern industries themselves, as we know from many countries, are inspiring and show great potential, especially in Norway, for example, where the Norwegian Museum of Hydropower exists at Tisedal. And some energy, it, you might think, was particularly impossible, particularly given, for example, the gas industries contaminating uh, processes. It leaves a terrible legacy behind. But even gas works in places like Amsterdam in the Netherlands have been very successfully converted into other use. But perhaps this is the best example I've come across, which are these amazing gas holders, not gasometers, gas holders um, in the city of Vienna in Austria, which were converted in a project commencing in 1999. I mean, wouldn't it have been tragic if these had been lost? So there you go. Again, Austria, an amazing cultural center, but not really known necessarily for its industrial heritage. Some of our infrastructure and landmarks are not necessarily as spectacular as that, but uh, we can say for sure that canals are really significant. And in Scotland, our canal system has provided an enormously important conduit through the center of Scotland that has acted as a means of promoting regeneration in some of our most deprived areas. And 
really attracted some amazing projects like the Kelpies sculptures on the right hand side. These canals were brought back to life uh, thanks to thousands of volunteers stopping the railways who bought them, destroying them in the 1960s, and then literally digging them out by hand. And now we have across Scotland and the UK a most amazing canal system, which is used by hundreds of thousands of people every year and is a, a, a fantastic uh, source of regeneration and community building across the country. And some of our maritime navigation and shipping heritage has also been uh, a great source of regeneration and tourism. So our lighthouses are amazing. Some of these lighthouses were effectively designed by the same people who designed the lighthouses of Japan, for example. So there are lots of international links to be had here. So uh, really huge potential. And even some of well, the most potentially unattractive things like concrete have huge potential heritage value. One of our most important concrete monuments is the Glenfinnan Viaduct, otherwise known as the Hogwarts Express Viaduct from the Harry Potter films you can see here at the bottom. And the, this amazingly revolutionary concrete uh, technology uh, pioneered by uh, Robert McAlpine uh, was then taken forward into the 20th century into the offshore oil platform construction. Here you can see one of the condeeps built in a Scottish fjord being towed around to Shell's Brent oil field in the 1970s. A thing of, built on the most amazing scale, wondrous technology, heroic technology. And this is something, again, our Norwegian colleagues are really interested in promoting, given their own interests in Condeeps and the oil industry. So really amazing stuff. And these industries demonstrate the value of forging links with working industry. Our historic industry can not only work towards our future in terms of and also provide all sorts of links with existing industries and skills and so on. So we need to think positively, and, as I said, see our industry always as a potential asset. And talking of our future, we in Scotland um, are leading the way in terms of building climate action plans to try to address the climate emergency, particularly in the context of the heritage we manage, because we think our heritage can work towards mitigating some of the effects of climate change, particularly by seeing its value and not demolishing it, not destroying it and reusing it and recycling the embodied energy already invested in it, but also understanding the thermal efficiency and performance of some of these old buildings and working out how to adapt them so they work well in the current environment and in addition trying to work out how the new excessive rainfall damages these buildings and work out how to reduce the damage so we're doing a lot of work in that sense and finding a new use, a second life for often substantial industrial buildings has to be a good thing more generally. So, so we've been doing a lot of work and we will continue to promote sustainable development, sustainable reuse, adaptive reuse of our industrial heritage wherever we can. And we want to encourage this on a global scale. And of course, nowhere better can be found examples of the texture of recycling industrial buildings than Taiwan. And over the last few years, I've been privileged to visit both Taichung and Taipei and seen some fantastic adaptive reuse of industrial sites um, and done with such flair and energy. So really good to see. And I know that there are similar pieces of work being done across the Asia Pacific region. Great work in Japan and the People's Republic of China um, and obviously in, in India too, there's some really good conversions and really creative solutions uh, being found. Um, so inspiring stuff and um, great that I, I managed to see these particular examples in person. And just to look at the, the um, Asian Network's website is to see something that is um, growing and inspiring. And so congratulations to all of you that have been working on that, it's fantastic. And talking of um, excellence, I suppose it's important to refer back um, to where the Artiki voyage in Asia began, which was in Taiwan in 2012. Um, and that was a magical experience. And we made, met, made many new friends from across Asia 
at that meeting. Um, and this is my uh, moment to uh, say a little bit about um, Tiki itself and how we are trying to address some of the issues, the pandemic issues, and just to observe some of the phenomena that are going, that are occurring at the moment. And I think the first thing to say is that we are trying to modernize our membership and to extend it on a global basis. And um, we are very aware, for example, that our membership in the Asia Pacific region is not what it should be. To that end, uh, we have a new Secretary General in the form of Marian Steiner, who has been doing great things, um, arranging for the uh, revamp, a refresh of our brand, of the design of our bulletin, and of our membership literature. So Marian's been a, a, a absolutely wonderful influence, and I'm hugely grateful to her for her support. So you'll see in the latest issue of the, 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 the bulletin what it looks like and we're translating membership materials into lots of different languages. Stand by for Mandarin. Uh, that's going to be a new one coming your way. Um, so I hope you appreciate the way it looks and that the bulletin's getting stronger and stronger and we can we hope to continue to strengthen what we offer our membership. And a key part of that is we are offering a much more affordable membership that's based on ability to pay. So if you're a student, you can join for as little as $5. The standard rate is $10. And if you are an adult non-student, it can be as little as 10 or as high as 40, depending on what you feel and how much support you want to give. We're also going to be offering a sponsored membership. So we're going to put offer, we're going to invite people to uh, contribute uh, contributions, donations to Tiki, which, which we will support completely funded membership to people in countries who find it very difficult to afford our membership at the moment, just to start people off so they can get a taste of what membership's like. And I urge you, if you haven't joined yet, to join. If you have joined but your membership has lapsed, please rejoin. And where you can, please encourage other people to join. One of the features of membership is that you register on uh, the, the member's um, interest, member specialist uh, web, web resource. And you can, if you're willing, can have your details made available to others and your specialist interest. So you can find out who else out there has a similar interest or you can find areas of expertise that are lacking in your country. But we need everybody that joins as far as is possible to sign up to that. So we build up this international network of expertise. So do please join. One of the things that's been most extraordinary about the COVID pandemic has been the response on social media, the digital response. And I guess the first time this really came to light was through the work of Francesco Antonio from Italy, who started up a COVID-19 aftermath initiative on Facebook to which I and others contributed. And this bounced me into the world of social media because I'm a bit of a social media cynic. Um, and what happened was absolutely inspiring. And since then, I've been digging into what is, I think, a, an iceberg, only a fraction of, of what's out there. But there's been an amazing range of uh, Facebook resources. One of my favorites is the industrial culture and photography uh, site uh, by the incredible Victor Macha. Now take a look at this stuff and watch these films. And, I mean, he's a marvelous photographer and cinematographer, and he's been to places you wouldn't possibly believe um, across the world. Um, and many of these places are disappearing and Victor has been recording them. And now as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people are seeing this stuff. So good on Victor, it's just marvelous. And there's so many other places, places uh, resources on, on Facebook. Obviously, Tiki has its own website, but there's national pages like Brazil and India. There's urban industrial heritage, industrial heritage and art, and more than one site devoted to water towers, if that's your thing. So really, you can actually just get sucked in, never to reappear in the world of industrial heritage and Facebook. And I'm very grateful to everybody that's been doing this. And I hope very much that we can embrace all these people in the Tiki global family and harness some of the energy that they are expending more effectively. One of the other things that we've been able to do in Tiki is start 
to work on advocacy issues more effectively. There's been quite a few major cases, for example, in Mumbai, in Sydney, in Budapest, in Stockholm. This is the most recent one, and um, this is a beautiful fish-bellied steel, early steel railway bridge um, in Silesia, in Poland, which was scheduled to be blown up as part of the, the Mission Impossible film film set for the next film, hence my term, a cruise missile threat from Hollywood. And so uh, particularly Poland solicited my help in trying to stop this happening. I sent a, mess a letter to the Polish Prime Minister. Piotr Gerber campaigned uh, frenetically on the ground. They got the TV involved. And I can safely say this is the only time I can remember my signature appearing on a letter, um, on a TV program. Um, so I'm really, really excited by that. And we've been successful. The Polish government has relented and has now protected the bridge. So we're absolutely delighted about that. And it shows what you can do by fighting together. So that was marvelous. We've been signing agreements. So the latest one was in St. Petersburg in Russia before the pandemic began. And that's been hugely exciting. Uh, Russia had been offline since its Congress in Nizhny Tagil in 2003, so it was brilliant to have them back in the family. Uh, it was an incredible event, um, a culture forum in St. Petersburg, uh, which we were fully integrated into. So there again, industrial heritage was being mainstreamed in a wider cultural context, which was marvelous. Uh, one of the more exciting things was having to sign this um, in Russian, I have no idea what it says, but I think it says what it says in the English version. So uh, we're really delighted that, that I'm very, very grateful to our Russian partners and colleagues for helping us do that. And there are more in the pipeline. So we are slightly stalled with our Saudi Arabian adventure, but hopefully after the pandemic that will get going. And really what I urge you in the Asia Pacific region is please get as many countries as possible uh, involved and organized at a national level in Tiki, you'll be most welcome. Which brings me on to one of the reasons for getting organized, which is uh, national congresses. As I said, the Asia story began in 2012, um, and now the, we have a new congress coming up within a year. Um, the last congress was in South America, in Chile, um, and that was when I was elected as president in Seoul, this amazing World Heritage Site. And the next one is moving to North America. And the lady on the left in the scarf, Lucy Morisset, is organizing the next one in Quebec and Montreal, Canada, in exactly a year's time, um, in um, October uh, 2021. So I hope as many of you as, of you as possible will be able to get there. One of the big challenges will be to make it happen. And still, there's lots of uncertainty surrounding it. So this is uh, the, the call for papers um, that it may well have expired by the time you see this presentation. But if you really wish to contribute and a paper or a session or join a session, please keep an eye on this and do contact Lucy if you've got a really, really good idea. I think it's really important that the Asia Pacific region has a strong presence especially in the aftermath of COVID. There's going to be some great sessions. I, for one, am really looking forward to the atomic the nuclear energy session. And what that demonstrates is that there are some interesting uh, contested histories that need to be addressed by industrial heritage. We're going to be doing things differently, having learned some great lessons from other congresses, not least at Lille and Santiago. So one of the things we've noticed is that the national reports are really amazing and we don't want to have them tucked away in a concurrent session. So we're going to put aside a substantial time for as many countries as possible to deliver short presentations on what's been happening in their countries in the last three years. This should be really, really interested. And if part of the conference has gone digital and is live streamed, I hope that this can be shared with an even bigger audience across the world. So we really hope to innovate and improve the Tiki Congress experience. Perhaps the biggest thing to note from my perspective is there's gonna be a, 
elections to the board. So if you want to get involved or you want to vote for somebody else to get involved or nominate somebody else to get involved, for example, to become president or whatever, which would be great, please get yourselves organized because only national representatives can vote and you need to have five ticky members to have a national representative so you need to get as many members as you can signed up in your countries get yourself a national representative so they can then in montreal vote in a new board so we're hoping that ticky 20, 2021 will be the best yet and that we it will be a conference where people actually attend and that we will at last meet our friends again and meet many more friends I say again, please come if you can. I'm, I'm sure our Canadian friends are going to put on a great show. And finally, a couple of general comments. Never underestimate industrial heritage's power and particularly within that railway heritage. You know this in all of your countries, everybody's got railway heritage and people who love railway heritage. So use that because of all the branches of heritage, it has the greatest educational power. We've used a piece of our railway heritage to great effect, deploying laser scanned digital 3D technologies to create some incredibly powerful education resources launched by our cabinet secretary for education um, and our deputy first minister, John Swinney, last year, using the fourth bridge and creating 3D models. Because my message to you is it's time to pollute our younger generations with industrial heritage. It is so powerful. We are feeding this into our curriculum for excellence and promoting science, technology, engineering and math subjects, which urgently need to be promoted in our schools. Industrial heritage does this better than any branch of heritage. So our go forth packages are now available directly through our web resources across all schools in Scotland. So we're delighted by that. But we also need to think more broadly about skills and the potential fusion of our tangible and intangible heritage. So we need to use these more effectively um, in the future. So some quick conclusions. Industrial heritage has its roots in our working communities across the world. It is unique in having such strong connections with real people. It is not exclusive. It is not excluding or elitist. It is the heritage of the people. It's a force for sustainable and um, sorry, sustainable development and for regeneration on a human level. It has far more potential for adaptive reuse and a second life than most people realize. Most people want to clear it and see it as a liability, so we need to persuade them otherwise. It also tackles some difficult histories, and these do not need to be so difficult to handle. And as a really good example at the moment, a lot of Scottish industry had the roots of its investment and its raw materials in slavery. This is a difficult history, but it's also fascinating, and we really need to address it more intelligently. And again, this has strong links into education. So it is an incredibly powerful educational resource on both historical and technical levels. One thing the pandemic is likely to do is to give a lot of people more time. So more people will be able to contribute and volunteer to look after their industrial heritage and bring it back to life. And more than any other form of heritage, our industrial heritage can act as a bridge between generations because older people who used to work in this heritage are in a brilliant position to keep it alive and to pass on the histories and cultures and traditions and techniques to new young generations so that these facets of our heritage can live on. And perhaps more than anything, our industrial heritage is an incredible link between our intangible heritage and our tangible heritage, whether that is the brass bands of our coal fields and our coal mining communities, or whether it is the techniques associated with electrical engineering or looms, hand loom weaving, or electrical looms or anything else of a technical nature, but which is old and dying out, we can keep it alive, a hugely important part of our tangible heritage. 
Thank you very much for listening and I hope the rest of the forum is a big success. Thank you. Following Dr. Miles will be the talk by Professor Mike Robinson, Director of Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage at the University of Birmingham. Professor Robinson's talk is titled Operational Strategies for Cultural Heritage, the Development of Cultural Roots. Hello there, I'm Mike Robinson. I'm the Director of the Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage and also a Professor and Chair of Cultural Heritage here at the University of Birmingham. And I'm very sorry indeed that I can't be with you in person um, for your forum, the third forum on Asian industrial heritage conservation. But I know that it's important work that you do. And so I hope that within my short intervention, I can at least sort of stimulate some debate and help a little bit in formulating some ideas for the future. And today I want to talk to you about cultural roots. And cultural roots are becoming an important strategy for the cultural heritage sector. And I believe they are probably one of the best instruments, one of the best tools we have of making cultural heritage more meaningful to the general public and also for the very preservation of some cultural heritage that is very valuable to us. I want to talk about what I call the operational strategies for cultural heritage and how these cultural roots can help in strategizing, in making our cultural heritage um, more sustainable for the long term. And I'm going to take the example of Ironbridge. It's an example I obviously know well, but I also work with the European uh, Institute for Cultural Roots, which is a, a body of the Council of Europe. And I've worked with UNESCO on developing special cultural roots across Europe based on World Heritage Sites. And cultural roots take up a large part of my time now, and I'm very passionate uh, about what they can do. So what I'd like to start with is for us to consider some of the realities, some of the pressures that are on cultural heritage sites as we speak. Every type of cultural heritage, and I know that your interest is mainly on industrial heritage, and that's a particular sort of interesting challenge. All heritage requires ongoing costs to conserve the site and to manage the site. And these costs don't go away. Um, Management costs a lot of money now. Uh, opening sites up, proper conservation of industrial heritage in particular can cost a lot of money indeed. And of course, as we know, no matter where we are in the world, there's increasing pressure on the funding for all types of cultural heritage. Whether that heritage is funded through the public sector or whether it's funded through the private sector or a combination between the two. And I guess within the UK, we've become um, uh, very used to having a what I call a, a mixed funding system. So with some funding from um, uh, the public sector, from governments directly, but also through the more independent, the charitable sector, private sector, and a mix of different funding streams. I have to say that in my experience, 
as I go around the world, as I went around the world post the, previous to this crisis, um, I'm always disappointed on the lack of what I would call sustainable management strategies that are in place for cultural heritage sites, whether they are archaeological sites, industrial sites, museums, or very big monumental sites, world heritage sites. Time and time again, managers and uh, ministries tell me we are existing on a day-to-day -day existence. We don't know where the next funding is coming from. All you need is for a, a disaster, such as the one that we are faced with in the mom at the moment, um, and buildings fall down, tourists don't come, revenue streams are stopped. There's a crisis almost on a daily basis for many cultural heritage sites. But there are other pressures on cultural heritage sites. We need to engage with various audiences in, for cultural sites. Now, this can be tourists, um, which are a very important audience for all heritage sites, but also local communities. It's important that we involve our local communities properly in not just in the sort of the the day-to-day -day running of sites but also in their long-term sustainable um, protection and in particular it's very important to engage with the younger generation and this is a very big challenge from experience i know with the industrial heritage sector as we have moved away from the industrial cultures which gave us industrial heritage. So younger people now see industrial heritage as something very distant in the past. They see themselves very disconnected with it. And that's not very good for the future. That doesn't bode well for the long term. And there's also a problem of what I would call fragmentation because we have a great many cultural heritage sites and they increase on a year by year basis. And this creates its own problems. And I'd like to pick up on this fragmentation issue in a little bit more detail. Because there are many positive aspects of having lots of small small scale cultural heritage sites. And in a sense, they have grown through the enthusiasm of um, local communities, of volunteers, of heritage enthusiasts. And they are very good at cementing local identities um, uh, and bringing something um, special into local communities. So there are many positive aspects of having lots and lots of little cultural heritage sites scattered around um, a region or a nation. But there, it also brings problems. Because when you have so many little heritage sites scattered around the place, we don't get any economies of scale. We don't have those ways of utilizing effectively the small resources that we need. And the other thing is, everybody's competing against everybody. Now, I can tell you that in Britain, I've always been surprised at why Britain is the birthplace of the railways, the sort of the real cradle of railway heritage doesn't have a World Heritage Site related to railways at all. And part of this is because we have so many different sites related to railway heritage, stations, um, uh, um, uh, production works, um, 
old lines, locomotive restoration works, but they're very fragmented. They're not working together. They're not telling a, a holistic story. And so they are all competing for the same level of resource, very competitive. And of course the budgets for cultural heritage are sometimes very small and very fragile indeed. And I would suggest they are maybe too reliant on public sector funding. So when a crisis comes along in the health service or in the education service or, or a natural disaster, one of the first budgets to be cut is the cultural heritage budget. When you are just a small site fighting on your own, it's very difficult to compete with other sites. And you also, there's, you also get a sort of what I call the island effect, that you're very intensely in, engrossed in your own site, but you're not seeing what's going on in the other sites, in your own region, your own country even, and certainly internationally. And so there is a lack of sharing and the lack of sort of sharing of expertise, not just in the technical aspects of heritage, but in the management aspects of heritage. And that's why I think the, uh, the, the forum, the Asian International Forum is so important because it should be the organization which does engender uh, collaboration and sharing of expertise and knowledge. And this brings me on to another issue with regard to the small scale and the, and the fragmented cultural heritage sector. And that is, it's difficult for small organizations to be heard politically. And uh, whether we like our politics or not, we have to be represented in a particular way. And having lots of little small cultural sites is sometimes very difficult to get our voice heard um, uh, when there's lots of bigger voices asking for resources, asking for help around. And there's another dimension I would point to with regard to the fragmentation of sites. And that relates to the audience. And we have a, a saying in the English language, and perhaps there's a similar saying in Mandarin, that we can't see the wood for the trees. We're so busy looking at what's in front of us, we don't see the bigger picture. And that sometimes leads the audience, whether it's tourists or whether it's just local visitors, even the local community, confused sometimes in terms of the meaning of the heritage. And we're missing out the bigger story. We don't see the bigger picture. And this is where I think cultural roots are important. And I'm going to pick on one route, but I could have picked on many routes because the principles are very similar. And the route I'm going to look at is the European route of industrial heritage. Now, this is a, I hope, in sort of interesting to, for, for this audience. But it's interesting for me because, um, uh, because of the Ironbridge connection, but also my interest and my passion for industrial heritage around Europe. Now, the European route for industrial heritage started life in about 1999, something like that. And it started as a network, a very loose network. And it was, it had some funding from the European Union, and it was basically there to help promote tourism to industrial sites, because industrial sites are not always at the top of the tourist list. And recently, um, uh, two years ago, it was validated as one of the 38 validated Council of Europe's cultural routes. There are 38 of these special cultural routes 
which go through a process of validation um, uh, and evaluation um, every three years and to get the title, to get the brand of Council of Europe Cultural Route. And the European Route of Industrial Heritage now falls part of that Council of Europe family of cultural routes. And you can look this up on the uh, Council of Europe's website, just Google cultural routes and there's a lot of information there. The European Route of Industrial Heritage has about 1,850 sites taken from countries across the whole of Europe. And they are sites of different sizes. Some are very big monumental sites, which you will have heard of. Some are very small localized sites. But the very fact that we have a cultural route allows themes and sub themes to be developed from different parts of that route. Now, those could be sub routes based upon um, geography in terms of a route within a country, but importantly, they relate to sites which are thematically defined. So we can talk about sub routes to do with canal systems, sub routes to do with just coal mining, sub routes to do with ironstone mining. So railway heritage, lots of different variations, but having these things linked together is very important, particularly at national and particularly at transnational level. It's important for tourism because it's very unlikely a tourist is going to travel some distance just to see one small site, but they will travel if there are a network of sites, a route of sites which are linked together. And these are important for telling the bigger story. Now, I've just downloaded a map of the what we call the anchor points of the um, uh, of the European route of industrial heritage. And you see there that it's a very dense concentration of these sort of key areas, which are gateway points to lots of other little sites. But again, you can look at this on the um, uh, on on the um, on the map of the um, of the industrial heritage route site. Now, why do I think this is relevant for Ironbridge and the day-to-day -day operations? of Ironbridge. Well, Ironbridge has been an important anchor point for this European route of industrial heritage since its creation. And of course, it's an anchor point. It's the, we, we say it's the birthplace of the industrial revolution. So it's important that we're included. But we're included in different ways because it's not just the birthplace of the industrial revolution. It's also the birthplace of the production of iron in a particular way using coke. It's also, it has important aspects to do with the ceramics industry and the production of pottery and porcelain. It's obviously been a coal mining site. It has transport links to sea. And then of course, there's the famous bridge itself, the iron bridge itself. So it's an important part of what we do is to tell the story of how we are linked with the rest of industry in the past and now through industrial heritage. So it places the Ironbridge site as part of a, a wider network, a wider transnational narrative, which let's reminds people that we were all connected. The industrial world was connected through flows of production, through different techniques of production, through the goods which were exported, the goods which were imported, the objects which were produced, and the communities which shared similar identities and similar ways of life. If we talk about coal mining, 
we can talk about similarities between communities in Taiwan, in Japan, in China, in, in Australia, in, in many parts of Europe, in, the, in North America. Everybody's bounded by the, the theme, coal mining. And there are links that we can talk about through trade and through colonial histories, good and bad, and of course, through contemporary travel. And I think this is important for Ironbridge because it makes Ironbridge feel as if it belongs to a wider community a what and has a wider voice, a bigger voice in the world, in a sense. Now, I think this is a good strategic direction for Ironbridge to go forward in the future. The industrial route of industry, the, the European route of industrial heritage is a powerful marketing device for tourists. Cultural routes are very important for marketing purposes. And across the route, whether it's from a big site or a small site or a number of different sites, there are regular flows of ideas, projects, and partners. We have ready-made partners in the cultural route itself. This is really important for funding purposes because funding is very competitive. Partners are very important for funding. And as you know, the UK is now stands outside of Europe, but nevertheless, as part of a network, we can access European funds. We can't lead these networks, these, but we can be part of them. But also for heritage donors, it's much easier and much more sort of um, ready to, to be part of a cultural route, part of a wider framework to get money from a heritage donor than it is just for one particular site. And it gives us a stronger voice, both in policy terms and in political terms as well. Importantly, it helps our interpretation of our heritage. It helps tell the bigger story, how Ironbridge is not just a localized site, but how it connects to other parts of the world. The goods which were produced and made in Ironbridge using the various techniques were exported across the world. And this is a really important story to tell because it, it provides ready-made links for us to, to link together. I think cultural routes provide a good strategic direction for all types of cultural heritage, not just industrial heritage. Cultural routes are more important than ever because in the situation that we're in at the moment with pandemic, there's more emphasis on protectionism and new nationalisms, and we have to break those boundaries. We have to remind people that we were once linked in many different ways through our heritage, through the past, and we are still linked because we share this cultural heritage. So collaboration, cooperation in these is going to be needed for post COVID-19 recovery purposes on so many different levels. If we talk about protection and conservation, well, that relies on shared knowledge and expertise and building partnerships and cultural routes allow us to do that. Cultural routes give us what I call strength in number. They provide a critical mass. And that provides greater access to resources, to funding, and also to ideas. And the very fact that we're having this discussion now, and hopefully you will be having more of a discussion, is, 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 is important. Critically, cultural roots bring meaning to heritage, to our cultural heritage. They tell us that these things weren't 
So cultural heritage sites weren't just built in isolation. They link up, they have a bigger story to tell. I just need to go to the, the, um, uh, the National Museum in Taipei and stand outside and look at the outside of the building. And I see the influence of Roman architecture, of Greek architecture. I also see Japanese influence. And inside I see French interiors. So you know, the, this is the story. This is a, a wider story than the in individual site. And I think um, uh, we need to think carefully about what connects our heritage. So I would ask you to think about these questions. What connects your heritage sites to other sites in Taiwan? And importantly, very importantly for a Taiwanese uh, event such as this, what connects sites to other parts of the world? And I know from my experience in Taiwan, there are many things that connect to different parts of the world. What commonalities, not differences, what commonalities can you identify and share to help build cultural roots and their global audiences, their, or certainly their transnational audiences? And how can you share your route with non-European audiences and new generations, the younger generations? How can you make it relevant and meaningful? And I put a little quotation there from um, Aristotle, who talks about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And maybe in the future, for future generations, we need to aspire to a more transnational approach to our cultural heritage, which is embedded in the day-to-day -day operations of our individual sites, and which allows us to strategize and to think in a much more um, meaningful way about not just sustainability, but how we engage with one another in these very difficult times. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, as I say, I wish I could be there. I only wish I could be there in wonderful Taiwan, but hopefully in the near future, I hope to be so. Thank you very much. The final talk today will be delivered by Paul Mahoney, who is the National Coordinator Historic Heritage at the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. The topic of Mr. Mahoney's talk is Forest Railways of Asia Pacific Region and Industrial Heritage. Hello, this is Paul Mahoney from New Zealand presenting Forest Railways of the Asia Pacific Region. This is an interesting part of the industrial heritage of our region. I hope to assist you to evaluate this heritage. I identify three important forest railways in the region and others may yet be found. I also identify some key management challenges for this heritage. The principal role of forest railways was to transport logs from harvest areas to sawmills. They are a key element in the four-step industrial process for wood. One, growing forests. Two, harvesting trees. Three, processing logs. And four, utilising wood. Forest railways are part of the second step, harvesting trees. These research questions can help identify and evaluate forest railway heritage. One, what was their historic extent? Two, what heritage survives today? Three, what is the heritage value? This paper gives an Asian Pacific Forest Railway Heritage Overview. They were widespread. Most Asia Pacific countries had forest railways. I present case study examples from nine countries and give overview 
information for each. These are the case study countries. As we go through, uh, one feature will, you will notice is the great variety in technology uptake across Asia Pacific. Ideas from all over the world. Three alternative forest railway technologies spread globally from the 1880s, from the USA, Europe and Britain. All three models had influence in Asia Pacific and they were often blended, adapted or improved. Examples of forest railway technology are steam skidders, geared steam locomotives and rail tractors, all specially designed for this industry. And from the 1920s, Russia, Japan and China evolved national models. Taiwan is the first case study. The 72 kilometer long Alishan Forest Railway still operates in the Central Mountains. This forest railway is world class. It has replaced forestry with tourism. Taiwan overview data. Six major forest railways once existed. Today, all are gone except the Alishan Main Line remains operational. It is potential world heritage. Japan case study. The Ambo Forest Railway on Yakushima Island, 26 kilometers long, is operational. Japan overview data. Japan developed forest railways from the 1880s Meiji era to harvest the remaining forest. Today, all are gone except the 26 kilometer Amba Railway, which is high value heritage. Tourists would love to ride this railway. China. This has the potential for notable forest railway heritage, but the question is what survives? Overview data. China had extensive modern forest railways dating from the 1920s. Today, it's likely all are closed and it's cert uncertain how much of this heritage survives in China. Possibly the last forest railway closed in 2014. North Korea had a large scale forest railways and forested areas in the north. What survives? We don't know. Overview data. Forest railways were established by Japan from the 1910s and built new into the 1960s. Today, it is uncertain how much of this heritage survives in North Korea. Philippines case study. The Insular Lumber Company in 1974. This was largely USA technology. It operated from 1907 to 1975, supplying a sawmill at Barangay Fabrica on Negros Island. Overview data for the Philippines. Little is known of the historic extent of forest railways in the Philippines. Today, all are closed and it seems unlikely that any of this heritage survives. Malaysia case study. This is a forest railway near Banting in 1976. This was fully British technology. Overview data for Malaysia. Little is known of the historic extent of forest railways in Malaysia. Today all are closed and it seems unlikely that any of this heritage survives. Indonesia case study. Sipu Forest Railway in 2008. It was fully European technology. Logging operations ran from 1915 to 1998. The network extent was 300 kilometers. 30 kilometers remains operational now. Indonesia overview data. Little is known of the extent of forest railways here. 
Today, all are closed, but at least part of the Jibbu Forest Railway survives for tourists. Australia Case Study Australia has some of the world's strongest and most durable timber. The Huon Timber Company, shown here, blended British and USA technology. Australia Overview Data Forest railways were widespread, with notably extensive systems in Western Australia. The last closed in 1964. None survive intact. Examples of skidders and locos do survive. New Zealand case study. We favoured locally designed and built equipment. This gave wonderful diversity. Over 600 forest railways once operated, and I am the author of a book on these. New Zealand overview data. Forest railways were widespread. The last closed in 1970. Heritage challenges today. Here are the closing dates of the last forest railway in each case study country. The list highlights three countries where confirmed forest railway heritage survives, Taiwan, Japan and Indonesia. More work is required on what survives in China. Forest railways existed in at least nine other Asia-Pacific countries. Does forest railway heritage survive today? There are three key questions. What was the historic extent of forest railways in your country? What heritage survives today? And what is the heritage value? To assess heritage value, a key factor is to know the wider context. There are three critical wider context factors. One is global contextual information. Two, the industrial role played by forest railways. Three, the distinctive value attributes. All of this context is available uh, in my Tiki Technical Papers since 2014. Global Overview Context. Forest Railways were once widely used by the forest industry globally in at least 86 countries on all continents. The era of most intensive use was 1870 to 1970. The last few examples survive in 2020. Historically, their principal role was to transport logs from harvesting areas to sawmills. Industrial role context. Forest railway technology advanced the large scale industrialization of the forest industry. Over time, they developed into a specialized type of railway technology. Their primary attributes are to be found in mountain forest settings that pose the greatest challenge. Their evaluation includes assessing the primary attributes that made forest railways distinctive and successful. Primary value attributes. The first two attributes in this table are forest railway primary attributes. The other four attributes reflect the World Heritage System and they work well for national sites as well. In an evaluation of forest railway heritage, these attributes can be scored. World heritage potential of forest railways based on my project work since 2012. Well, first there's Ali San and Taiwan scores highest in the world on value attributes using a scientific process. Possibly there's an alternative Serial World Heritage nomination of four sites Ali San in Taiwan, Cass in the USA, Visu Jisu in Romania, and Ambo in Japan. 
other sites in Asia Pacific could be national heritage. Challenges to achieve sustainable heritage management of forest railways. One, finding an adaptive reuse model. The railway must generate core income plus give visitors uh, a great heritage experience. Two, climate change impacts. Uh, note Ali San's experience with typhoon damage. Three, COVID impacts, the loss of international travel and the cruise ship market. Four, maintaining authenticity and skills. Uh, the Puffing Billy Railway in Australia is a successful example. To me, one of the best ways uh, to uh, address these challenges is to have good communication with other heritage railway operators and around the world and to pull your ideas. To conclude, most Asia Pacific countries once had forest railways. The conclusions from this presentation are that the Ali San Railway in Taiwan is outstanding in a global context. The Amba Railway in Japan is notable in a global context. Other notable railways may exist in Indonesia and China. They need to be assessed. A written version of this presentation is available. And for specific forest railway projects, I'd be pleased to help support them with uh, advice. So thank you for your attention and interest. It's uh, Paul Marnie from New Zealand. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, super. How are you here, Miles? Good. Good morning or good, good afternoon. Hi, Miles. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, Miles. Good afternoon. Hi, uh... Hello, Moshi. Thank you, Hello, Hasti. Hello, Mike and Paul. Hi, Mark. Hello, Moshi. Hello, Asti. Hi. Hello, Mike and Paul. Hello, Mark. Hello, Moshi. Hello, Asti. Hi. Hello, Mike and Paul. And may I request everyone to please turn off their mics? Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, what wonderful Hello. presentations we had. Uh, thank you very much to all the three speakers. I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Xiao Wei Lin, uh, who is the chair of ANI and also the board member from uh, Taiwan at Tiki, to make some comments. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for our three outstanding speakers to share their many years uh, expertise with us. Uh, I don't say I will make a comment because I see many of you are much more senior than me and has a lot more experience. But however, I would like to share with something which I learned from you together. Yeah. So I think from Dr. Um, Ogunofer's uh, talk, I think we can see he particularly mentioned about the, strat the strategic value of industrial heritage. 
and uh, its broad application all over the world. I think this is quite encouraging and uh, give uh, many of our Asian colleagues has a much more broad idea in terms of how to uh, uh, reuse it and uh, how to protect it. Yeah. And the second point, I think he also mentioned about it's very important to build up a concrete uh, link between histor uh, historic and uh, live industry. I think this is also involved with some of the conservation for the working industry and uh, also the community. And nowadays, I think we see more and more like some uh, for example, like we see some uh, steel industry in China and also in, Cor in uh, Korea and also in Japan. They all gradually open some for the public to involve with such a live uh, working industry. And uh, the third point is about the education. Yeah, I think British is very particularly good on the heritage education. And we can also see how it's coming to the use on the industrial heritage, such as the STEM activities. So I think this is a great idea to engage young people and some more community uh, to get involved with that. So personally, I think I get a lot of inspiration and thank you very much for your sharing an excellent example all over the world, include uh, the Catalonia Industrial Network and Polish um, and so on. Yeah. Um, okay. Then the second one is about uh, Dr. Robinson's uh, presentation. Uh, this is also really uh, specifically echoed to our Annie's thing. I think uh, Rob, uh, Mike uh, in bring up the problem of the uh, lack of uh, the sharing expertise and knowledge and uh, how to involve with more public engagement in uh, together on the conservation of industrial heritage. I think this is also emphasize the end of ANI and what's the point and what's the, how important of the ANI establishes for, for the, uh, the global uh, world. Yeah. And uh, the second thing is about uh, uh, Mike also talk about the cultural roots which can help to tell a bigger story. I think uh, this is very true. And this is also why we um, already talked about we want to build up this Taiwan's root of industrial heritage because we try to connect a smaller uh, cultural heritage site together in order to telling a bigger story. And uh, this can also help to the uh, protection and also the national identity for uh, our uh, industrial heritage. Yeah, and uh, I'm also very impressed about how you use the example to talk about how to bring the meanings to the cultural heritage and make it relevant to people in Iron Bridge and other uh, particularly case study. And uh, lastly, uh, I think I would like to thank for Paul's excellent example on this kind of semantic study on the forest railway. I think this will give a very good example for later on if we want to develop this kind of syndrome of forest railway in Asia. I think that could be our uh, kind of brief uh, database for the uh, for our studies and for the future uh, cooperation and so on. So I think this is uh, my uh, impress, impress, impression and uh, this is what I learned from all of you today. Yeah, so I give the mic to back to Mushit. Thank you, uh, Professor Lin, um, and thank you to the three speakers. Um, I, I found that your talks uh, had a common, uh, urging us to do something in common to uh, through all of these, which is to bring together um, this vast amount of uh, resource that we have with us across the world. And um, if I can say in three words, which stood out for me amongst uh, all your presentations was uh, to make connections, to build connections, to build communities, 
and to build confidence, a word that Miles, you briefly touched upon, but I think is very, very crucial for us uh, in this field. So I would say these three things is my takeaway, but it's been such an illuminating afternoon for us. Um, I'd like to um, open the floor for questions, and I have one for each of you uh, to begin. So Miles, um, I have the first question to you, which is, uh, of course, very topical today when we're talking about COVID. We're also dealing with multiple other crises. Uh, well before COVID hit, uh, climate change, um, intolerance, authoritarianism, violence against women and children, people of color, et cetera. So we're, we're a, we're a crisis-ridden world. Uh, do you see new forms of solidarity emerging amongst industrial uh, heritage sites and museums to respond to these. Uh, you've spoken very well about these uh, great examples like in Kuna, uh, etc., which are leading the way. Do you see some new forms of connections emerging? Could you talk about that? Thanks, Moshri. And, and yes, I, I do, because um, one of the themes that I tried to address in my presentation is the fact that industrial heritage is the people's heritage. And so if you, for example, go to somewhere like Detroit and look at the car industry, most, most of the workers in the car industry ended up being Afro-American. Um, and and so, so it's very much their heritage and that applies across, across the world. So we have an advantage in that respect. Um, and um, I mentioned also that we have some really, really difficult contested histories um, within our remit, which includes slavery in the UK's case and in Scotland's case in particular, and we were so one of the best, well, we were very good at slaving um, at the height of the slave trade. And most of our industrial development relied upon it heavily. And yet that doesn't come through in a lot of um, the way our history and our industrial heritage is presented. So we're going to have to change that. And that poses great opportunities in terms of education and in terms of the identity of, of many communities that have often been marginalized. Um, and as you, sa you said the word, which is confidence. And what I think is really important is we need to step out of these difficult histories. And we, Asia is full of difficult industrial histories. And most of industrial heritage has terrible links to warfare and was of, often industrial development was driven by warfare, whatever it was. So we need to address these issues with confidence um, and, and look at the, the histories are fascinating and there's good parts, flip sides to the bad parts as well um, in terms of humanity. So the confidence you say is, is, is absolutely crucial, especially as what we have to do is to, is to influence decision makers who determine the future of our industrial heritage. And we have to, we have to put together something that is attractive to them and, and to the people that have the resources that that, are, that that can be invested in our industrial heritage. So um, exactly what you say, this is a really, really exciting way forward for us. And um, we can grab victory from the jaws of crisis, uh, whatever that crisis is. And particularly, in, as I said, in the case of climate change and sustainability and sustainable tourism and, and so on. So there's so much we can do if we take a positive approach. Yes, thank you. Uh, Miles, uh, Professor Robinson touched upon these ideas uh, and made a great impression with this process of gathering together thematically sites that can be strategically, but also technically, conceptually be such an important, vital thing for us to present new ways, I mean, present new histories, uh, stories that haven't been told before. I wonder, Professor Robinson, whether uh, you would like to, uh, you know, comment on certain themes that you see emerging when we extend this idea of um, the roots of industrial heritage into this part of the world with Asia and Asia Pacific. What kind of themes do you think could be, uh, you know, the new themes um, to gather together these ideas? I, I think just following up on Miles's comments as well, I mean, you know, there, there is a lot of contested histories in the Asian region, um, not only um, between Asia and the rest of the world in terms of um, colonization, but also within, um, uh, you know, in an intra-regional uh, sense as well. 
And uh, I think one of the the joys of working with cultural roots is that forces people to think about these relationships both in a historical context, but also in a contemporary context as well. Where are those sort of those flashpoints in the past, which either still exist or or maybe need to be overcome? And I think that um, certainly, and again, it echoes something that Miles said. There are there are common languages within the the context of industrial heritage. People who are people who are involved in the mining industry share, you know, common emotions, common experiences, common language, common technology. And uh, again, there's no difference, um, uh, you know, when you put you know old mining communities together to talk to one another, which I've done in the past. They have a lot to share, but they also have a lot of grievances as well. And again, you know, it, it, it's a very interesting way of bringing people together to to talk about those difficult issues of decolonization, which is something that we have to look at. And um, I mean, I know a little bit of work about uh, in in Kuna uh, in, in in Spain and how it's linked back to to, to what happened in South America and the, and the colonialization of South America. So again, there are very difficult stories to uncover, but only by sort of trying to sort of bring publics together and communities together, um, I think we can allow um, a voice some of these really difficult issues. But I would also say, um, uh, and it's again, it reflects this notion of sort of solidarity. What cultural roots do is they, they create critical mass. And it's much more difficult for politicians to ignore critical mass. Um, yeah. uh, and, um, uh, and that allows access to resources. And we've seen this in many I mean, you know, I, I, I do a lot of work with the Council of Europe's um, Cultural Roots program, and it's, it's, very, it's very hard for individual sites sometimes to access resources, access yeah. expertise. But when you put them together um, mm -hmm. and you, you have this solidarity, it's much easier to, to, to access politicians and resources in that way. So that's, that's where I stand on this. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for that comment. Uh, I would add another C to the three C's that Miles raised, uh, which is critical. I take critical as an important word from your discussion, saying we need to talk about critical heritage. And we also need to talk about this critical mass, this idea that we need to achieve this politically and otherwise uh, by working together. So uh, very, very important uh, uh, for all of us here in Asia Pacific to reflect on this uh, I think, um, thank you once again. Um, Paul, uh, over to you. And my question is uh, uh, with forest railways and my experience, and I'm uh, reflecting from where I'm sitting in India, is that mountain the forest railways are fighting two parallel battles. One is to save the forest and the other is to save the railways. Um, um, is there something wrong that we are doing? How do we reconcile this? Thank you. Um, yes, there's a, a, a contested history with um, forest railways as well because uh, of the, the shocking legacy of forest clearance that has happened throughout the world. But again, there's uh, 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 this this opens to a new strength as the other two speakers have have noted because around the, the globe there's a, a move to sustainable management of forests and and so in in my presentation i had a a, a couple of uh, modern forest railways in new zealand and and uh they're involved with the harvesting of of forests that are run on a sustainable basis and and of course with climate change um the 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 there's a, a uh, an increased need for people to understand and engage with uh, forests. Uh, they're, they're, they're a, a source of wood, which is really a, a, an ultimate sustainable resource, which is recyclable and biodegradable. And they're also a fantastic uh, carbon store uh, and an oxygen producer. 
So forests are part, very much part of the future. And I think those countries that have got uh, for wonderful forest railways remaining, they provide a very special way for people to get into those forests. And, and the operators of those railways can provide uh, experiences that are relevant uh, to the, our, 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 the future way we um, uh, manage forests. And so I, I've, in, in my presentation, I uh, drew attention to three outstanding examples of forest railways in uh, in Asia that, that, that uh, exists. There's Arisan in Taiwan, there's Anbo in Japan, Japan and uh, I think my pronunciation's right, Chepu, that's in Java. So Hasty can train me up on that. And, and look, all of these three have uh, adapted uh, to sustainable development models. So they're on, they're on the right track already. The, the logging has been ceased for 10 or even 50 years in these areas, and they now carry visitors, they carry tourists instead of logs, and they take them into, man uh, into areas that are managed as protected natural Forest. So the tourists use the railways uh, to access their forest experience, and uh, you know the railways could actually be used for to support um, uh, programs. For example, uh, I, I don't know if countries can can get people to do have volunteer holidays where they go for a week up in the mountains and assist with replanting, but the, some of these forest railways are ideally suited to even supporting uh, that sort of an experience. So I, I think there's, uh, there's a great future for them because they, they, they offer a unique way of participating in something that is so relevant to our future and to the survival of the planet. So the, the sort of contested history part can become part of the pointed to the where we need to go in the future. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to continue with making a list of all the good C words from the conversation. So I add contested and climate change. I think this uh, industrial heritage, forest railways, mountain railways as sites for coping or building resilience uh, in this time of crisis is a very important point that you have raised. Thank you very much once again. Um, I'm going to now um, invite Hasti to make some comments and observations before I take on questions from the audience. Hasti, over to you. Uh, good, good morning from Amsterdam. Hi. First of all, uh, Paul, uh, you you, uh, you spell uh, Chapu very right. Thank you very much. I'm very proud you remember Jaffa. Uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, to trigger uh, your ideas from all of the speakers about something that bothering me so much, because on daily basis I have contacts with uh, practitioners of uh, preservation uh, in Indonesia, and uh, it, it's not that uh, there is a lack of man, uh, money for conservations uh, there for adaptive use. Uh, the the awareness about uh, cultural heritage, uh, especially industrial heritage, is 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 uh, is getting better now, and uh, they have some uh, initiatives to take uh, adaptive reuse from old sites. What's uh, bothering me is that because of lack of uh, probably knowledge and uh, certainly lack of experiences. Finally, the adaptive reuse of industrial heritage become a kind of beautification projects. The intentions was good, but because of lack of experience, uh, so they, uh, yeah, according to the to the to the conservation uh, guidelines, it says uh, even uh, to the standard of the the, the environmental friendly approach. It is wrong because, for example, that uh, they cut uh, the old trees and they uh, they uh, replace it with a tent, a kind of tent for shadow, Th that kind of things. Uh, and beautifications uh, in in I think in Southeast Asia that I, that I know for sure happens quite often. So it's not that because lack of awareness but because of the lack of experience. 
uh, what what uh, you all of you have a lot of experience what 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 are your ideas how to prevent more of beautification projects uh, of this good intention it's very pragmatical but uh, if i see all of the examples from europe from uh, other parts of the world um, they all look like perfect projects of course uh, at least uh, from the physical point of view but uh, yeah what, what what are your ideas about it yes please miles um, <clears throat> i think uh, good question hasti and, and a lot of this sits with the need for authenticity and integrity which are UNESCO values, um, as well as other, other heritage uh, organizations' values, and did, it's not, it's, it's almost Disneyfication in some, some areas, and it's sanitization. And if you look at, look at the, particularly the intangible heritage and the, what actually makes in, the tangible heritage work and what matters on the ground, that texture is, is the crucial part of the site. And that is very much back to what we were saying about the people's heritage. And so we do need to have the confidence to be able to say to people, this is, this is really important. Without this, everything's meaningless. So a lot of it's down to the quality of the storytelling, the narrative that we create, and, and not being bullied by people, consultants who come in who don't know uh, don't understand the site properly. Um, so yes, back to Moultrie's observation, we need to be confident of our ground and of the importance of the people's history and of that key relationship between the, the tangi tangible and the intangible texture. If you don't have if you're any understanding of what it is you're recording and how it works and what it did, then both the tangible and the intangible are devalued. If that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Professor Robinson. Yes, I'm going to use another um, C here, and that's capacity building. Because um, uh, one of the issues, I think, is, um, uh, is that it's very easy to sort of, for people from Europe and the rest of the world to sort of jet into Asia and, 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 and again, sort of uh, go with the, um, with, the, with the normal discourse of beautification or whatever that a, a government or a region actually wants. And um, I think we have to take a slightly different approach and try and sort of be involved. But I think the people, the local communities have their knowledge, their sort of uh, in, implicit knowledge about how these things should be done. And so we have to listen to local communities who, you know, all forestry communities, mining communities, et cetera. But we, the, the problem with that is we are at a critical moment because, you know, these skills and traditions that can make a place not a Disney world, but something very real, they're dying out, you know, because people are, you know, it's just generational change. And so we have to find ways of harnessing their, uh, their collective knowledges, um, which we can feed into um, processes of, uh, of conservation um, uh, and don't rely upon um, uh, very sort of what I would call short term models of just making the place look attractive for tourists. Um, uh, but actually sort of it may be a long term thing to to just to get things right but one things once things are right and people understand the meaning behind why these places are like they are why you use certain materials in certain ways i think that sort of that becomes embedded in communities and visitors actually want to understand this you know from a from a tourist point of view tourists are, are looking more for the authentic experience so you know i think Capacity building and getting um, uh, the politicians again, politicians and planners to listen to 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 the to the tacit knowledge which is embedded in these places in the first place. I think is very important indeed. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a tough uh, job, as you mentioned. This you know this kind of careful 
curation of this and then being authentic about it, having a lot of integrity, um, because beautification projects at the very heart of them are just basically, um, you know, um, inauthentic ways to uh, cherry pick certain things that you want to showcase. So I think uh, this uh, kind of capacity building, uh, this crafting together, which is a slow, tedious job. These are the kind of new methods I think uh, the study of industrial heritage can bring forth uh, as against what Professor Robinson says, you know, consultants parachuting into a place um, to offer, um, you know, some new new ideas can be replaced if we look at industrial heritage with a more slower and careful ways to, you know, not not repeat the same mistakes that you Hasti, you're worrying about. And well, so are we here in India constantly. So I um, I think this is a, a very, very important point that you all have raised here today. I have one question uh, from the audience, and this is uh, from uh, Jan of Giestan um, from Stockholm. And he's uh, the question is to Miles, which is, um, and he says, uh, you've shared the importance of coal mining sites. Um, there are numerous such sites on the World Heritage List. Such, such sites carry a dark heritage in today's climate crisis. How is this addressed in these sites? Are there any good examples that you can share? Um, yes, the, quite a lot of our mining heritage has a, a very difficult history. I think one of the most interesting ones is Zolverein because of its association with with National Socialism. But also, yes, there is the issue of of the impact that the uh, the harvesting of energy and the consumption of energy has had on the current climate crisis. And um, just to give you a good example, yes, la last year we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the death of James Watt and the 250th anniversary of his invention of the separate condenser, which transformed uh, steam power and industrial industrialization. And we encountered quite a few people who um, weren't very impressed and thought that this was a disaster for the planet. And so we had to um, mold our message to acknowledge the fact that obviously we are where we are. Um, but at the same time, uh, what Watt did, James Watt did, was improve the efficiency of the steam engine by 90%. So that basically 90% less fuel was consumed to create the same amount of power. Um, and so there were swings and roundabouts and this back to the contested nature of most of our industry. And, and almost all of our industry has um, polluting um, a capacity exploitation of labor. If you look at uranium in Czech Republic and, and East Germany, that the concentration camps, I mean, just really difficult. So yes, we have to address these issues. And as we said earlier, make them work for us uh, because they can work for us if they're handled correctly. Uh, thank you, Miles. Uh, Professor Robinson? I just wanted to add to that in terms of what we've been trying to do at Ironbridge because, you know, the 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 standard narrative has always been, you know, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution of, you know, the first coke-fired furnace in 1709. But, you know, if you flip that and say, well, this is the birthplace of global warming, and um, that has been a very contested narrative to actually sort of put forward uh, for some people. But two years ago, I brought together a range of climate change scientists um, and we had a symposium actually, you know, at the site. Um, uh, and that was that was a way I saw that as a way of sort of, of, of recognizing the the change which has gone on over the, the, the past decades in terms of how we think about this and in terms of putting something back um, and, and being seen to be actively doing something about this. And I think using industrial sites as physical sites as platforms and stages for these sorts of debates is very powerful indeed because you know it 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 brings home the sort of the historical legacy that we've built up in terms of global warming over many you know many years um but it also shows that we are engaged with the contemporary issues of climate change 
Um, and again, other issues as well. I'm, you know, we're talking about global warming here, but it could be anything. So there's lots of aspects of dark heritage, I think, that we can address full on and use. We can't, you know, we can't eradicate the heritage in the sense. We have to re-narrativize it and re-adapt it and reuse it to actually sort of, you know, engage with these contemporary debates. Um, I think this is also the huge sense of responsibility that we have to deal with in the storytelling of industrial heritage, where, uh, like as you said, so certain climate scientists are literally marking the moment when we started altering the face of the planet irreversibly as the moment of industrial revolution. So if we are able to tackle these two things together, it places a responsibility on us to be able to tell these stories and create space for these stories within these sites. Um, and that is a way to, you know, to respond responsibly, responsibly, I think. Um, Professor Lin, would you like to make uh, some uh, comments uh, on this in this regard? I think uh, uh, you, your discussion just bring up one quite important issue. Uh, so far, most of the time we are dealing with industrial heritage on the more bright side in order to attract more tourism, tourists and so on. But in fact, the dark side or the critical heritage is an important issue among the Asia, such as colonialism and pollution and so on. So I think this will be the direction which we can work on in the future. Yeah, so this is a good direction to go. Paul, over to you. Yes. We are, as the generations and times evolve, uh, we we have to pick on, uh, pick up, and address other issues and other themes and. And so uh, I'll just give you an example uh, uh, from New Zealand uh, of uh, uh, one of our uh, main coal mining sites, a place called uh, Deniston. And one of, one of the themes that we uh, examine on site is the, uh, it's a place that was the birthplace of soap in New Zealand. So, I mean, it was an awful place to work, awful working conditions, unsafe, uh, but that actually led to a more equitable society for New Zealand in the long run. And that's one of the stories that we're able to tell. Uh, it, it was the start of moving towards governments that, that, that care and better working conditions and um, better uh, living conditions as, as well. So I think some of these challenges that are thrown up uh, are actually going to make us uh, uh create more audience relevant experiences into the future that are again relevant to uh, people's future i mean the whole COVID thing has thrown up the issue of governments that that care and uh and that that's be, uh, that's become an issue for the for the whole world and uh look I, i've just got a couple of quick points about the beautification projects issue a, a, as well and uh, a very powerful tool with industrial heritage is what I would call oral history so that's uh, interviewing and especially video interviewing of people who were there at the time and, and there's often a need to move um, fast on this uh, and especially I, I mean there's some wonderful people when I've been to Ali San I, I've met a couple of people who I'll remember all my life uh, who, who uh, engaged personally with me um, but the, the the power of these interviews because you can also interview wives and 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 the children that lived in these places but but they can actually help to bring ugly to life like ugly becomes a uh, part of a powerful part of the brought to life uh, and it can make us appreciate uh, where we've where we've come from and where we've gone to, you know, in terms of working conditions and, and living conditions. Uh, so there are strategies uh, where ugly 
actually uh, the difference between ugly and beauty uh, becomes a strength in our story. So that's, and, and my fi third point on all of this uh, uh, is that one of the, I think one of the strengths of forest railways as a heritage investment is that they can they can actually legitimately be a beautiful beautification project. Like if, if some of the forest railways want to get, have a, a regeneration and Florence enhancement project as one of the, as their future roles, then that is actually a, a, a legitimate role in terms of authenticity and integrity. Many of them, especially ones in Europe, were, were, were built to uh, be sustainable um, uh, industrial uh, fa facilities. So, uh, Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd now like to invite Professor Lin to make some concluding comments. I think we have uh, uh, had a very, very diverse set of uh, concepts uh, being raised in this conversation. So if you could come in to summarize this uh, for us, please. Thank you. A uh, very excellent moderator bring up uh, a lot of discussion and thank you all for your excellent presentation and uh, Hasti's participation for two days for our discussion. I think in the end, uh, basically, uh, Moshe already uh, sum summing up with some uh, some keywords. Yeah, such as the uh, community, uh, cooperation, and uh, critical uh, the climate change and so on. I think we can uh, emphasize those points and to work on our uh, continuous work. So first of all, we can discover the com uh, communities of uh, Asia and continue our close uh, or transnational cooperation in the future, go through the AMIS uh, network. Yeah, and the second point, I think uh, currently we need to uh, engage with more younger generation to use industrial heritage uh, as a kind of bridge to uh, bridge up the different generation and also bring up to our daily life. And this is all our uh, effort for the future. Yeah. And uh, the third one is about uh, the uh, adaptive management and some re resilience uh, development. So we should uh, currently, although we are all uh, stuck in our uh, own country, but I think this is also a good timing to look inward, to find out what do we have. And uh, in order to prepare for the futures, uh, uh, such as uh, other uh, international global tourism and so on to uh, to continue to develop our network. So uh, for this two days conference, I think uh, we have a, overall a global uh, point of view from um, Miles and from Mike Robinson and also Alex here earlier, he also talk about uh, a lot of different uh, international organizations which already work on the related field. So I think we can uh, outreach with this kind of uh, connection uh, with ANI. And uh, the second point is about the uh, function and the continued work of uh, ANI. I think we will continue work as what we try to do as uh, information exchange platform and also cooperation uh, for each other in the future. Yeah. So lastly, I would be very happy to announce that. Uh, thank you for Mushi's enthusiasm. Uh, she's uh, uh, trying to send a proposal for our uh, fourth forum for the next year. So we look forward to uh, Mushi's uh, forum proposal in order to have our uh, on the Asia in, uh, Industrial Heritage Year. Uh, network the conference in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful to have you this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to more such sessions from Ani. Bye bye. Stay well. Bye bye. Uh -huh.